Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience. Uh, it was the last presentation of the day, and it's been a fantastic two days. So I'll just crack on through, it won't take too long. Um, from our experiences, the way we see it is, if you tell the guys in the field, this is what you want to do, this is what they'll end up building exactly out there in the field. So be careful what you put into the model, and that's the way we see it. Our guys follow exactly what's on the drawings, and that gives me problems. So for us, looking at it from an M&E perspective, we're trying to avoid these types of scenarios where we end up have coordination or clashes that looked great in the model and looked well. And then you end up with services that are added in at a later stage. So your conduits clashing with your duct over there, and then you've got your valves that are clashing then with your trunkens. So like what uh, Kavl just said there, a lot of the guys are young people, but they don't have the field experience. They don't orientate the services the correct way for us. And we come along, we then have to start moving again and taking it out because they didn't allow for the, the servicing or getting in to put the cables in or accessing of the equipment. For ourselves, just briefly on Kirby Group, we're a full M&E package uh, company. We do a mechanical electrical control, and we also do T&D power substations and wind farms, which we do a lot over in the UK. We will be 50 years next year, and we're delighted to say that our, we've increased our staff from 450 last year up to 600. So we are growing very well and moving stronger in the UK. So as I said, these are our services, mechanical and electrical, but we're also starting to do civils works now, and full turnkey packages for a lot of our high-end clients, such as follows. And we're delighted to say that in IBM, uh, we've won two massive jobs over there in London, one in London and one in Portsmouth, which I'll show you. And they've asked us to be the main contractor driving the whole job on the site. So for us, we have a dedicated BIM procedure. We saw that this was being a problem and that we needed to have our own procedure first, coming from a quality point of view, how we control that, how we control our outputs, our isometrics, and we're constantly reviewing that. We have a dedicated BIM manager and we have 21 BIM guys spread across a couple of jobs. So as we develop the procedure, we look at it and we see where it can be, improves constantly all the time. So conferences like this are giving us the information that we need. We also realise as well that a lot of our uh, services don't have the services drawn, like the uni struts, the brackets, the supports, the pipe work, the termination connections. These all have to be put into the model. So we've started developing our own library, and we've over 40,000 different components in that library at the moment. We also drive our own isometric drawings off the back of that, 3D drawings of trunkens, trays, and conduits. And that allows us to control what we need to do, so we can use that and bring it into, out of the model and develop our systems. For us, the experience in the UK is the PASS 1192 standard that's coming out at the moment, and also the PASS 91 in regards to pre -quals. We're starting to get asked a lot of more questions of what our understanding and experience of uh, BIM is and how we, that relates to us from an ME perspective. We're also looking at the ISO standard, which is just more of a framework, and we'd like to get certified against that standard if we can. The other standard that we've come across is the AEC standard from 2009, um, but at the moment, we are always governed by the EU or the British standards or the regulations. And this compounds it for us because we would have over 450 different regulatory standards to meet on a job, depending on the different services, as you can imagine. So therefore, that makes it complex for us. And we have to make sure what's in the model is correct, what comes out. So it affects the flow rates. So if we have to reroute something or change something, that has a knock-on effect on the cable calculations or the loads or the demand on the building. And in that time, that has to be picked up in the construction phase or picked up towards the end of the job at the commissioning phase. So something very important. For us, this is where we're operating at the moment. We have a London base, but we also have a Warrington base. And these are the seven recent jobs that we are doing at the moment, just finished up. We also do a lot of stuff up in Scotland and uh, Liverpool and the uh, north of England on substations and T&Ds because a lot of the system is creaking over there and it needs to be upgraded and modernised. So for us, uh, the jobs that I'll be touching upon is, uh, from a point of view of the BIM is, Hexel didn't really have any BIM, but we've been asked to do a feed study now for their next phase of the project. And we're going to start using BIM on that, and we've, we've a few consultants in as well as helping us on the design, where we're working directly with the client. On the molecular products, it was another job again, but again, no BIM usage, and we weren't asked to provide some. We also did a GSK, GlaxoSmith client, on a bottling plant over in Colford on the West, uh, Welsh border. And again, we were using things like compressed air up to 63 bar because of for the bottling lines. So that it took a lot of effort to design that and make that fit and to allow that to work. As we said, in, in Portsmouth, we're also doing a live data center down there. It's a mission-critical data center turning over 2.5 million uh, pounds a day 
for clients like uh, Campbell Foods, Jaguar and Marks and Spencers. So we are changing out all the sensible coolers there in a live environment and BIM would have been very helpful for us on that to allow us to work it out. Fitrex we're also doing is an ATEX area and we're doing a bit of construction there. And the only other job that we kind of really have is Molson Cores and the last job is a, cl a confidential client. I'll show you pictures here of Molson Cores and some of the sketches that we've had, but unfortunately the model came to us again too late and I'll explain why. So for us, we can detect clashes as you can see here in this case using our Navis Works, our Navis Inventor. We can then look at these clashes where the sprinkler pipe, another specialist contractor we'd have to coordinate with and how we'd clear that clashes by just getting that to be rerouted or moving the ductwork. So unfortunately that's the kind of extent that we're involved in, but we'd like to be asked more and this is the questions that we come up across a lot of the time. Do you have the capabilities of working in a common, uh, common data environment? And we can do this. Are we able to do it to level two? We're similar to kind of global. We're in between level one and level two, and we're not being brought forward a bit more. Um, we also look at our capabilities, and they ask us a lot in our PQQs, can we do that? And we're starting to develop that capabilities and skills for our clients. And we also do a lot of training and investment in our people. So for us, this is the type of stuff we end up having to draw and that would have been beneficial in a model. This is for a medium pressure steam line on a pipe bridge. And again, we had to do the point load calculations and the weight because you're filling this, similar to the issues that you have in Diageo. But we've had to draw this ourselves and do all the cal calculations, working out at 47.5 kilonewtons loads. We've also had to do the bracketing details in this type of arrangement here, where we've had to sketch it out to make a fit. The model would have been fantastic for that. That would have made our time. We reckon we're losing about four to five weeks doing this effort, whereas if we had the model at the front end, we could have easily sped up the time for our clients in the programme, because we've got to allow for the expansion of those vessels, as the, the steam is, all, is up to 27 bar in this case. So it's beneficial to us that we get this information, because we can also be a trusted provider, for, as David said, and give a good solution to our clients. So for us, the issues that we see is there's little demand at the moment from our private clients, as you've seen, but that's starting to increase, which is good to see. But also the lack of m and involvement, if you get us in early, we can actually have a look at design for you and maybe help you and tease out some of the scope. Remember, you trust the doctor when you, when you, when you tell him you're sick. You trust a mechanic when your car is not right. But don't forget, you can ask the M&E guys at the bottom of the food chain, what's right in my model? Is my design right? Is my engineering thought out? And we can help you along in that way. So don't be afraid to ask. We'd be delighted to help out. We also find the design houses seem to hold on to the design. They seem to give a lot of stuff in PDF. Be a bit more open is what we're asking, and we can then take that design and model it for you and give you back a better service. Because at the end of the day, we have to produce as built anyway and record drawings, so we might as well do it on the same model once together. And uh, unfortunately for us, it's been sold as a clash detection tool. And just to kind of wrap up then, we believe why BIM is what Alan asked me to think of us, we collaborate with the M&E contractor. It's about getting moving from a 2D to 3D, saving us a lot of time and effort, which will then speed up the program and give us better delivery. And for me, as a quality manager, it will help reduce defects because it gives us more time to spend on the commissioning and the testing aspect of the job. And therefore, we have less rework and less snags and less issues. And it gives us a better fit into the model, which is what ultimately we're all here for, for the end user and the client, that they get a service. M&E is getting more and more complex in buildings, as you can see above you in all the services. We rely on the power, we rely on the energy to drive this stuff. And without it, we won't have it. And it will also allow us to move into the 4D phase on the time and also the 5D. And the benefits will definitely accrue. So for us, unfortunately, we still have to do field verification checks against these models. We still have to go out there, even though it's built, and start checking against it. And that's what our site supervisors have to do, because it doesn't always exactly fit in the model. We've had an instance where two columns were built, but they were actually slightly off skew. But in the model, it looked like a dead straight line. And when we started putting in the services, our services started looking a bit off plumb. We were a bit concerned. And when we went down with the engineers and all, we found out it was actually the building was slightly off skew. But everything hung off that. So if the model isn't right at the start, it'll have a knock-on effect later on down the line. So it's good to check. And that's my presentation. So thank you very much, guys.